Uh, I just came across this article uh, written a couple years ago, but just recently posted online from John Walton, a closer look at the conquest of Canaan. Um, my thanks to James McGrath, who tweeted this, and that's how I became aware of it. I wanted to just take a look at it. It's only a five minute read and uh, offer some thoughts. So uh, let's begin. So Walton says, I'm going to read from here. A hot topic of discussion these days is the conquest of the land recorded in Joshua. Skeptics find this a soft spot for attack as they rant about a genocidal God, criticize a violent scripture, and challenge Christians about how they can serve a God who would do such a thing as command the annihilation of whole people groups. Let's just put the pause button there to begin with. On this passage. So the first thing I want to say is I think it, it's kind of uncharitable to say that skeptics are looking for a soft spot of attack, quote unquote, or that they're ranting about a genocidal God. Rather, I think many people, they are, are horrified and understandably so by violent biblical passages, such as those that describe the eradication and violent expulsion of entire people groups from territory. Um, in the same way that a Christian would be horrified at reading these kinds of accounts and some other religious texts, uh, so non-Christians and non-Jews are horrified when they read these things. In a Judeo-Christian text, in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, it's not a matter of looking for a soft spot of attack or ranting about a genocidal god. Uh, I mean, rant is, is simply, I think, mean, not a very charitable term. I mean, it, it's certainly people are, are uh, inflamed, perhaps, and under, again, understandably so. Okay, so then the next part. Christians are getting the message loud and clear. They are confused and disillusioned when they find themselves unable to launch a defense. The answers are not found in insisting that God must have had a good reason for wiping out the Canaanites, who presumably deserved it. Um, good answers always start with careful analysis of culture, genre, and text. And so to those topics, we turn our attention. And then he makes five points. This is the, the one of the big takeaways, however, uh, for Walton's short article here, is um, the answers, he says, are not found in arguing that the Canaanites were so evil that they had to be eradicated. This is a sharp contrast with many conservative Christian apologists, people like Paul Copan or Clay Jones, who have made much about the argument that the Canaanites were desperately, uniquely sinful and thus had to be violently eradicated, cut out like a cancer, lest they infect the Israelites with their sinful corruption. Walton says, no, that's not the way that we should think about it. Okay, so then uh, we turn on to uh, the first point. Uh, the meaning of the word harem, usually translated utterly destroy or place under the ban, and needs to be reevaluated. It is a complicated word, but recent analysis suggests it has nothing to do with destruction. To designate something as harem means it is ineligible for human use. Therefore, God consistently refers to driving out the peoples of the land, especially so the Is Israelites do not absorb them as slaves or wives. The land and the cities belong to God, so the inhabitants must be driven out, an act of eminent domain. The identity of these people in the land, not the persons, must be eliminated. Oh, first of all, I'm not a biblical scholar like Walton. That much is clear. I am aware that, that there has long been dispute and debate about how to understand Harem. But I would, I would say this, first of all, is that the function of the word is understood and, and the implications, the implicature that comes with the word is understood within the whole sweep of the narratives in which it occurs. So in Deuteronomy 20, when, when um, God says in verse 16 and following, to leave alive nothing that breathes in the land, that sort of, I mean, that can be interpreted as, first of all, yes, hyperbole, perhaps, uh, which is something that Walton will touch on in a moment. And also maybe it's a, an, a literary idiom for also making sure they're simply removed from the land, but it also involves killing. And in fact, if you look at uh, the actual account in Joshua, like in Joshua 6 and the destruction of Jericho, it describes men and women, everybody within the city being killed. 
So you have pretty straightforward descriptions of mass slaughter. Um, so to, to say, well, it doesn't mean utterly destruction, utter destro utterly destroy, it means uh, removing from use, ineligible for human use. Um, I mean, I think that that's kind of niggling when, when you have the application of the term in context describing the mass slaughter of people. And I mean, what does it mean in a sense to remove humans from human use, right? If, if, you, if the Canaanites need to be removed from human use, well, that would reasonably be interpreted as uh, taking their lives. So second point, the, the genre of conquest requires literary analysis. As just, as just one of the important points, conquest accounts in the ancient world characteristically feature universalistic language. Taking this language seriously means not taking it literally. Throughout the literature of the ancient Near East, conquest accounts call for and claim total destruction, though it is not clear that this is, though it is clear that this is not actually what happens or even what is attempted. I, I love that line, and, and I've, certainly it's a familiar line and one I've, I've long agreed with, that taking language seriously means not taking it literally. Now, obviously, that's not categorical, but the point is that in many cases, in order to take language seriously, you, it means not taking it literally. When Jesus says, you know, you if you can have the faith that moves mountains, to take him seriously in what he's saying means not thinking he's simply talking about literally the ability to move millions of tons of granite. That's not the point Jesus is making. So, so to take him seriously is not to just take him in a wooden, literal fashion, and, and so it is here. And I think certainly that is a fair point. And the text itself, I think, makes abundantly clear that certainly not everybody is slaughtered. Or many people are driven out. Uh, the third point, uh, one I would just say as well, implied there is, is that there is exaggeration. So we have stock phraseology for the destruction of all people. Again, leaving alive nothing that breathes. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean literally to kill every living human being. Fair enough. But you still have masses of numbers of people being slaughtered and everybody else forcibly being drawn out. You know what? I'm sorry. One thing I forgot to mention here uh, in the first paragraph uh, that I did want to highlight. Um, when, when uh, gosh, I'm doing a lot of ums and uhs. My apologies. When Walton says this is an act of eminent domain, like a, a government, for example, claiming the, la the, the land of a particular individual, a privately owned land for the greater good of society. No, it's not eminent domain. This is what we call ethnic cleansing. By definition, this is today ethnic cleansing. So this is simply not an appropriate term to use in this context. Okay, so then we have third. In the ancient literature, we find a recurring motif across cultures and time periods of the invincible barbarian. In the use of this motif, all sorts of negative descriptions are used for threatening enemies. These descriptions are not accusations of actual behavior that could be documented. The biblical descriptions of the Canaanites fall into this category. One of the intriguing elements of this motif is that the opponents presumably can be defeated only by the gods. So, I mean, that, the good point for, that a biblical scholar would make, uh, pointing out that this is, again, stock language being used to raise up your enemies as this huge force to be defeated, which is uh, to be understood rhetorically and not in a, in a flat, literal way. Fourth, from a theological perspective, we need to understand the nature of the land promises more clearly. One important perspective is that the conquest recapitulates creation and is an order-bringing event. A second is that it is to be Yahweh's land, not Israel's. It is Yahweh's land specifically in the sense that he has chosen it as the place where he will dwell. Uh, Israel is granted tendency to serve as hosts to the divine presence. Fair enough. I mean, in, in the same way that many scholars have thought in Genesis 1, um, that the spirit hovered over the waters, for example, in Genesis 1-2, that kind of the implication here is that the waters represent the forces of chaos, and God is pushing back chaos and bringing cosmos or order, and there's something of a struggle there, but I mean, not a struggle that God is trying hard, but rather there's a maybe a more appropriate to say a process, a process of bringing chaos into cosmos, of God imposing order. Likewise, uh, as the Canaanites are driven out of the land, representing the forces of chaos, the Israelites come in, they impose God's order, and he dwells within the land. Fair enough, but of course, that's important from a literary perspective, and 
perhaps a theological perspective, but really doesn't provide any ethical explanation as to what is actually described in space-time as occurring. And then fifth, whoops, uh, so fifth, um, the status of the Canaanites then should not be understood as those who are guilty of heinous crimes. The characterization is rhetorical. Uh, again, this is, I think, a really important point, uh, which places Walton very sharply opposed to people like Clay Jones and Paul Copan, who really try to offer an apologetic, saying the Canaanites were just so heinous, so terrible, so bad that they had to be mass slaughtered and forcibly driven out of the land because they presented a real imminent threat to the Israelites. Here, Walton is saying, no, th this is stock language. But again, this raises the issue another level than ethically. If these people weren't so terrible, how could you justify a description of forcing them out of the land and slaughtering them? Uh, well, this brings me to, to the final two paragraphs of conclusion, which I think there's some really interesting things here that Walton says. So first of all, he says, these points do not resolve our ethical concerns about the conquest. Uh, the death, warfare, violence remain realities. Absolutely true. There, there is no apologetic here, I think, as such. Uh, but he says the events recorded in Joshua must not be confused with holy war or jihad. Uh, oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not persuaded by that. I think that concepts of holy war and jihad are broad enough that you could actually see very much what Walton has just described in this short article as conforming to some broad concept of, of God bringing holy war or jihad upon apostate uh, peoples in, in favor of his people. Um, but what I want to conclude with is what I found was maybe most interesting uh, is that Walton kind of ends with what I think is the spirit, what I call in my book, Jesus Loves Canaanites, the, the spiritualization of the text often has been understood in terms of allegorization historically. He says the application of the passage does not offer a pattern for a just war theory or provide justification for anyone's battle, no matter how just the cause. Application is found instead in the covenant pattern it offers for driving out that which is inimical to the presence of God. For us, that means we drive out the old man and adopt our identity in Christ. We are crucified with Christ, yet we live. So there is a theologization, a spiritualization of the text in order to apply it to the life of the Christian today, that what we should think of in terms of the literary form of the text as it comes to us is that it shows how, as the ancient Israelites drove out the Canaanites from the land, removed uh, their, their presence, so we need to drive out our sinful impulses within us and remove that presence. But we should never think that we can apply this in any way to actual people groups and provide a justification for violence and war. I mean, I, um, I think that that's, that's a very, can be very helpful, especially if, if you think in addition, ask this question, well, where did this text come from? Where did Deuteronomy and Joshua come from? And biblical scholars generally believe, um, I think it probably is fair to say it's a consensus opinion, but certainly not a universally held one. There are still people who think that these texts were written by Joshua or others, contemporaries or people close to the time of Joshua. But most scholars think that these texts, Deuteronomy and, and Joshua, were not written by Moses and Joshua, um, but rather were, were written centuries later or compiled into final form centuries later, likely at the time of, of the Josianic reforms and just later, so from the 620s into the 570s uh, and the time of, of the expulsion, the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 and, and the expulsion into Babylon, where the Israelites were sent into Babylon, many of them. And within that context, uh, see, then we say, okay, so the original readers of Deuteronomy and Joshua were people who were being sent into exile in a foreign land, many of them. And within that context, the message that comes through in Joshua or Deuteronomy is not, you have now a template to potentially eradicate, kill, and destroy other peoples. Rather, the message that comes through is you need to maintain your distinctiveness, drive out uh, sinful impulses, things that are not part of your covenant fidelity to Yahweh, and maintain that covenant fidelity even in exile. And likewise, we as Christians today can seek to do those same things. And so that would be, I mean, I think that fits into this spiritualization, if not in the sense a broad sort of allegorizing of the text. And I, I think that is a good starting point and potentially, I think, a much better 
approach to begin to think about the ethics and theology of the text than that conservative apologetic strategy that says, here we have one of those occasions where genocide was warranted, where you were in fact uh, justified, the Israelites were justified in slaughtering and driving out another people group because they were morally corrupt uh, beyond redemption and equivalent to a sort of cancer on the landscape so that you even had to kill their infants. Uh, this, I think, is a much better approach. Although, of course, it still leaves unaddressed the remaining question. Is that which is described in Deuteronomy and Joshua something that actually did occur at some point in the past? In this case, approximately 700 years earlier, maybe 1270 or 1280 BCE. Um, if the text was written in, you know, 600, 580 BCE, then you have it, you know, describing events close to 700 years earlier or so. Did, the, did those events actually happen? And if not, how should we understand the function of these texts uh, in terms of their historical narration within canon? Those are important theological questions, historical questions, and ethical questions. Uh, and but uh, certainly beyond, I think, the purview of this video to explore them. I just found it intriguing uh, that Walton offers this sort of spiritualization at the end of this passage and also offers something of a smackdown, I think, to some of the apologetic attempts to defend the Canaanite genocide.